Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the first coffee talk of the seventh fair for TAFAF New York uh, and the fourth fall fair. I'm delighted to have you all here. It's an exciting time for us to have a great series of programs, which I encourage you to look at. Doing a little shout out for the whole cultural program. So please take this with you and have a look through and sign up for other programs. Um, this morning we have, I have to say it, a powerhouse panel um, in store for us on a subject that you might not think is quite as provocative as it turns out to be, uh, I found out. And we're excited to have this great panel and the wonderful moderator, Jim Coddington, is going to introduce our guests. Um, and Jim, I'm happy to say, is available only because he very recently stepped down as chief conservator of the Museum of Modern Art. So it's very special to have this um, all-star panel here to, to begin the series. So I'll get out of the way and please turn your phones off. That's the main thing, okay? I know you think you did it, <laughs> but it's always good to check again. So thank you so much. Thank you, Linda, are we good to go? Um, I'm not going to introduce the panel. I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Okay. Morning, everybody. Um, I'm Michael Gallagher. I'm uh, Chairman <laughs> of Painting and Conservation at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I'm Claire Berry, Director of Conservation at the Kimball Art Museum in Fort Worth, Texas. Robert Verlang, Head of Conservation and Science at the Rijksmuseum, Amsterdam. <laughs> <laughs> So thanks everybody for coming out and uh, to listen to our thoughts today. I think that, <clears throat> I trust that you've read what we uh, have said we would like to talk about today to lay the groundwork for our thinking and your thinking um, about this. And I want to actually back up uh, even uh, prior to the question of conserving works in public. Um, uh, and that is what obligation do we have if any at all, to communicate to the public about what conservators in museums do. So um, uh, I would just like each of our panelists to address that you know, sort of very fundamental question about what is our obligation to the public uh, to describe and uh, get into any level of detail about what we do. We'll start with you, Michael. Um, I think there is a degree of obligation, and I think there's um, two sides to it. One is, is external and, and the public audiences, and one is internal. The external, I would say, is because in, in certainly in public institutions, the objects we work on are not ours. Um, and sometimes in the process of conservation, objects change, decisions are made, um, and all decisions have a subjective component. There's never any escaping that. And so I think the willingness to share the thinking as well as the processes, in fact, sometimes I think the thinking is more important than the processes, I, I, I think that is becoming more of a, an imperative. Internally, um, there is also a sort of very pragmatic side that conservators feel the need to make sure that the work they do is recognized um, by at the executive level. Conservation in an, in an institution is a very expensive thing, and um, more increasingly, more and more, um, I know as a head of department, when you have an idea, when you need something, it's how are you going to pay for it? And um, I think trying to get both uh, support financially by making it clear uh, how important the work we do is, um, how demanding and challenging it can be, and also uh, alighting a sort of interest and hopefully in the end a respect um, more broadly seems, seems key to that. So I'd like to follow up on um, the idea of there being this external and internal component to our work and start by describing my <coughs> workspace at the Kimball because I think there's a lot to be said about the simple design of the, muse of the, the conservation studio. Um, this, our museum, first of all, is very small in comparison to the Rijksmuseum, MoMA, or the Metropolitan Museum. It's more on the scale of a house modeled after the Frick, say. 
Um, it opened in 1972, and already in the pre-architectural program, they were very concerned with the qualities that the conservation space should have. They focused primarily on the quality of the light, that it needed to have north light. And for this reason, uh, Lou Kahn designed a studio with a full wall of glass facing north. We have exquisite light in the studio. It's, in my view, the best place to examine a work of art in the Kimball. But the other quality that was very important to the original planners of the museum was that the conservation studio be located in the part of the museum that was near the director and the curator's offices. Because the first director, Rick Brown, felt it was very important for the director and the curators to have an ongoing dialogue with the conservators about the work in process. And this has happened, and I'm so impressed with uh, this early planning that went into the museum. But as a byproduct of those two decisions, having an enormous glass wall facing north, having the studio at that um, end of the building near the curatorial offices, as a result, any visitor that walks into the Kimball and looks to their left can look beyond the receptionist desk, beyond a courtyard, and look into the conservation studio. I really think the Kimball studio is one of the first um, that was designed so that the public could have some idea that work was going on behind the scenes. At least you can see that there are people working on easels. Um, so it kind of combines both of those ideas, but I would say the idea of the public access maybe was a little bit accidental. It was a byproduct of those first two um, priorities that were set from the beginning. Thank you, uh, Jim, and, and thank you both. I mean, for externally and internally looking at uh, what is being done. I think um, that I will take it from a slightly different perspective also with the slide which is right uh, up, uh, or which is up right now. Um, and then obligation and public. Well, clearly in the views of people, the works of art that we see, they seem perhaps pristine or excellent. And, um, and of course, uh, as conservators, we have made them to the public to be indeed like that. But at the same time, works of art are not always pristine or in an excellent condition. So to, to give that message also to the public, to make them understand as to what it is that you're looking at, is not just the beauty and shine of what used to be and what is now there, but also to get a thorough and deep understanding what is actually really still there. And then you can relate to it to a painting, in this case, the Night Watch, which we are uh, examining as what you see there. And then in the whole process, uh, process of conservation that will follow up on that is really the process of, of, of showing, look, if we are going to conserve things or treat objects, what it first needs is a full examination. So not just that we, oh, we'll start working on it. No, 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 it's a thinking process. And it's something that you do together. So on a curatorial level, on a conservation level, science level, and an education level. So, and, and then bringing that message to the public, which is a full message that we can bring to the public. I think we've learned to understand that the public is really interested also in this. And, and so I want to take it from that standpoint and then really say, well, we have an obligation towards the public to show what is really there. What is it that we're looking at? What is, in this case, what is Rembrandt? So, and then in this particular case, uh, the Night Watch. So I cannot, well, talk too much about that yet because we're in the middle of, of the research program itself. Yet, the obligation I really feel is there to show what we have and what is still there. Do you have any comments amongst each other? Or um, feel well, free to it. Um, I might say that I'll put my cards on the table. I've never actually restored a painting fully in public in my years at the Kimball um, for a variety of reasons. Um, we don't have a painting as large as the Night Watch that really we would not want to remove from public view for the period of time that was required for restoration. Most of our major restorations are probably done at the time of the acquisition of the painting. We are a collection that is growing and evolving Again, it's a museum that only opened in 1972. That said, I think we are very, take a very active approach to sharing conservation information with the public. It's a very integrated approach. We have many, many visitors to the studio. Again, based on the idea that we are close to the director and the curators, we have many spontaneous 
unplanned visits, drop-in visits from the director, curators, and visitors that they bring with them. These could be architects who are really more interested in the space than they are in what we're doing. Or it could be you know, renowned art historians, other conservators. We benefit from conversations with them. Hopefully, they benefit from being exposed to our work, and we explain what we're doing. Um, we have a very loyal, um, long-standing group of docents who, um, who've dedicated decades of service to the Kimball, who know the collection very well, who come to every conservation talk we give. Um, we do docent training. They know the conservation stories that lie behind many of the works in our, in our collection. And on their tours, they integrate this information about conservation. Um, we do talk to school groups. We do give public lectures. We also contribute a lot of technical research to exhibitions, the Kimball plans. And often this results in um, essays that are added to the catalogs. And when we think the information is compelling enough or visually interesting enough, sometimes this includes a, an actual visible component in the exhibition space itself. So for the exhibition on the Lenan brothers or Picasso Brock, there was a whole room dedicated to our findings um, when we think that they're interesting, um, something that we can share with the public. So if I could just um, uh, ask then, uh, we've established that we all feel uh, an obligation to inform the public about what uh, uh, conservation does and uh, for very fundamental reasons around institutional mission. Um, but when it comes time to deciding what projects your institution might be involved with in projecting that information, um, uh, how do you go about doing that? Well, first, I just want to clarify when I said about the external, there are many, many ways of clarifying the work uh, of conservation, the imperative of, sometimes in, in the work in conservation uh, to the public. I wasn't saying, I, I certainly didn't mean that, that that has to be conserving something in front of the public, though I have done that. Um, we, have, we have not, as um, so far at the Met in paintings, chosen a project to, um, with the idea of doing something in the public eye. Um, we also, I mean, we have tried to get funding um, for certain projects. And uh, one very big public funder, we were told that Andrea Del Sarto wasn't a household name. So that goes off the table. So, and I'm incredibly reluctant to say, well, oh, cool, let, let's rustle through the galleries and see if there's someone they'll recognize um, to get money. I mean, you know, the, the depart. It, it's, it's funny, I think it's one of those things that we also have to get across to the public that you're a very incredibly big, rich, privileged institution and you're still grubbing around for money. You know, I mean, uh, we, we, you, you, you always need more staff than you have. You always um, are being asked, well, can you fundraise? So um, that's the reality of the world today. Um, I think I, I wouldn't want to choose something um, on that basis. We did, um, when we acquired the large Charles Lebrun uh, through the great generosity of Mrs. Reitzman, of Everhard Yar back in his family. A decision was made because um, it was a real coup for the institution to get this. It was, we, we recognized it was going to be Mrs. Wright, Reitzman's last great act of generosity. And we were worried that we were gonna say, isn't this wonderful? And now you're not gonna see it for 18 months. And so the decision was made to do a, an alternating blog between the curatorial department and myself um, so that every, t um, every two weeks a new blog went up and one would be art historical and one would be where the progress was on conservation. And that actually ended up with like a huge amount of, of hits and following. Um, and it was a learning curve. Whether it... <sighs> You know, the, the, the degree of information it, it passed on, the level of sophistication of understanding uh, it engendered, I think is, is highly questionable, though it was a success as a project. I think I rambled totally off your question. No, but you're actually um, right on it. But um, it, um, it, it, it's a very, it's very, I, 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 the last thing I'll say is, 
certainly, I, I, in 2003, I worked on a huge Benjamin West painting in Edinburgh because it couldn't be removed from the galleries and the director wanted, from the moment I was hired, he kept saying, when are you gonna tackle Benjamin West? So it was done in front of the public. And um, it struck me how it was impossible for it not to be a mediated reality. You, you could, I, I just thought you can't really put across the complexity of the choices, there were certain things I just didn't feel that, were, that I would wait till after hours to do because I thought I can't explain why I'm doing this like, you know, in this way. Um, it may seem alarming. Um, and, and so I, I, th I think that is always the trade-off between this um, trying to get across the complexity of something when people often really just want a sound bite um, that's what you always have to keep in mind. But, but I, I'm not, I, I tend to disagree with that, that, that people just want a soundbite. There's, there's a couple of things that come to my mind when, when I think of this. First of all, so the building that we have for conservation and research uh, with the Rijksmuseum is shared with the Cultural Heritage Agency of the Netherlands and the University of Amsterdam. It's 90,000 square feet in total of research just focusing on conservation uh, and, and study of artworks. Now, I've seen over the years the people coming by, like uh, what you say, indeed, many people coming by, very interested, and, and always uh, what people see is that many conservators like us or researchers are very passionate about the things that we are, uh, what our job is. And the one reason, I mean, for the Nightwatch, don't forget, it's the national icon. You cannot just remove it, you cannot take it away. The, the, the building, the museum is built for the Nightwatch. So it's not something that we can say, oh, let's bring it to a conservation studio. Uh, no, that's a no-go. So at that moment was also, we have to think in what way and in what manner can we make use of, of both things that play a role here. First, to make sure that you know everything about your most important painting that we have in our collection. And second, how can we make use of the thing that we have to do for conservation purposes and understanding what is going on? How can we now also bring that to the public and then say, look, this is actually the whole process that goes behind the scenes, taking place normally behind the scenes. And not only the public finds that very interesting, if I uh, look at my colleagues here, uh, Marijke Smallegang, who is also here, I don't know where you are right now, over there in the back, uh, responsible for communication and marketing, and then for the Instagram, and, and everything that happens every Tuesday at five o'clock, uh, and then Amsterdam time, what happens at that moment is that many people, many people, thousands, I don't know, in total, I believe we have more than four million uh, hits on that, or what? It, So over five million people, as a result, I think that really we have to bring, and we can bring conservation, bring that to a different aspect, not just the behind the scenes, but to really make that an interactive part of the museum where the public, to my belief, is very interested in to see what it is that we're doing. So the question should be, for that purpose as well, how are we going to... This is perhaps one example. This is an example, and not the example, but a example. And, and now the question is, how are we going to bring that to the public as well to make them understand not only what the process of conservation is, but also to bring that intrinsically to join them, to have the public join on the things that we're doing? Because there is a new, I would say, field of interest that we have not developed. And as conservators, I think that really is something that we're sitting on a pile of gold and we don't know where to dig. So, uh, in the, uh, uh, I granted that the Night Watch and maybe a handful of works in any collection are unique in their uh, public um, uh, perception and uh, the uh, inability to remove them from uh, public sites, uh, even under conservation. But uh, in the case of what you're doing with the Night Watch, um, uh, how does that represent, uh, in your mind, what conservators do on a daily basis? So, uh, in, in this case, we have 10 months of research, all tif different techniques. And is that 10 months a typical amount of research around no, the project? No, no, in this case, this is, so we go back content. What does the object indeed uh, ask? The object doesn't ask anything, I realize that, but what does it need? 
So what type of research techniques should you be using? Uh, are we going to do macro XRF? Are we going to do hyperspectral imaging? And, and if you say these words, then normally the people tend to think, oh, gee, what are you talking about? Macro XRF, what is that? <laughs> And then what you do is you make sure that outside of this glass wall that, that you see that, that there are two instructors, educators there who are indeed informing the public, plus you give the information on the walls, uh, and in this case we do that on, on the left. So to come back to your precise question as to, so what is it then that you have to show? Well, it depends simply on, on what it is that you have. I don't think that we would advocate to always go for conservation and to do this publicly. That's, that's not the idea. But to make use of this event, and I would, well, of Operation Nightwatch, to indeed show that, look, you didn't realize perhaps, but this is, what, this is what it takes in order to understand what it is that we should be doing. So I'm not saying, and our board of directors luckily also doesn't say, they don't say, oh, you get three years for this. No, it's not two years or five years or 10 years. I'm not saying, uh, we don't think about time in that perspective. What we think is, what does it need? What do we have to have? What, do we, what kind of information do we need to have in order to make the right type of decision in order uh, for a treatment to, to take place? Is it going to be restored? Well, we don't know. I'd like to follow on to both Robert and Michael's comments because while I have not restored a painting in public at the Kimball, I am involved in the work that Save Venice is doing um, in important restoration work in Venice. I'm on the board. And there are a number of very important restoration projects that they are pursuing at the moment, including the cleaning of the Titian assumption. And I would just like to suggest that when we look at these often very large paintings, that partly because of their size are perhaps being restored on site, um, we look at them in a case-by-case -case basis. And this is how it's in fact being handled in the Save Venice project. So for example, with the Titian, the way that that cleaning is taking place, um, the fathers of the church had input into that. Um, they made it clear that they were less interested in the painting being restored in public than they were in having a full-scale reproduction of the painting made to be put back on the altar so they could continu continue their liturgical um, services without missing that painting. The painting is just located a few feet behind this where it's being restored. Um, not on full pub public view, but members of the public have access by appointment to come and visit with the conservators. Um, and so there is some access, it's just moderated. Um, the same is true with the St. Ursula cycle. Um, they could not, those canvases were too large to be removed um, off site. And so they were restored on site, but in a closed room, the public would, could come and view the restoration and talk to the conservators by appointment only or by guided tour only. But other restorations, say in the Church of San Sebastiano, um, scaffolding was constructed and um, the Veronese paintings were conserved in full, full public view. It, so there's certain practical issues um, that enter into these decisions, um, but obviously we would want to capitalize on any projects as you're doing at the Rijksmuseum we would want to capitalize on anything that is being done in full public view to make sure they're understanding um, you know, what exactly they're seeing. Um, so just to go to your point, Jim, about what does it tell us about what conservatives do, I think we have to be very open that most cases when we talk about this, we're talking about celebrity objects. And there is nothing wrong with the, the focus that those objects bring to the work is, is something you are not going to get if you're doing Granny's portrait. Um, people will pay attention and they will listen more carefully. But I think you have to think of it as, you know when you get a folder's guide to whatever city or country, and in the first three pages you, you have, you must see this site and this site and that site. That to some degree is what we're providing. And because the complexity, the the day-to-day -day work is very different. Um, so I, I think that's what I mean by the mediated, that, you are, that there is a, a very legit, legitimate and possibly compelling reason to, to sort of share this information publicly and to find ways of en engaging the public. And I, I take Robert's point that there, there are many people who are, are deeply interested, but, but there is the rest of the book, you know. 
But how do you mean, Mike? What, what, what do you mean by with the rest of the book? Because Just as that is what we're trying to... I think you, we, we can only touch on a certain level of, of, uh, of work and, some, and, you know, and, and speaking for myself, I mean, I'm, a, I'm a head of department, but the minimum amount of time I spend is actually on the objects. And I think increasingly in every um, in institution, most conservators spend maybe 25% of their time in the way the public think of working on an object hands-on. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a worthwhile focused insight into a part of our work. It's a part of our work I find very, very important, but it is a part. I, I think that um, uh, some of what I've been trying to get at, and I'll get at explicitly now, um, are to um, uh, ask you to respond to what I perceive at least to be the biases in what winds up in a public restoration, whether it's in public or blogged about or Instagrammed about, however it is um, uh, sent out and communicated in public. What are those biases? Certain ones that I see are paintings, um, which are always a part of the, or are a part of many collections, but they are rarely the bulk of the collections. They're the celebrity objects that Michael refers to. And then I think that there is a, um, a fairly obvious and uh, documentable bias towards uh, a scientific presentation of what um, uh, is going on in the research. And again, I think that that's uh, somewhat misrepresentative of uh, what goes on in the conservation studio in uh, a uh, very fundamental way, presenting conservation as a scientific discipline when, in fact, it's very much a humanistic discipline. And I'd be willing to take um, a pushback or confirmation of uh, my biases towards what I perceive as the biases. And, but if I think, and some slides actually show up as well, uh, uh, where you see an iron map of, of the macro XRF, so XRF to... I guess I, I will have to inform you on that. Uh, is X-ray fluorescence? No, no. X-ray fluorescence spectrometry, where you look at which elements are we now measuring. So if it's red, then it most likely is vermilion. It has mercury in it. So if you measure then mercury with your uh, system, with your apparatus, then that shows up, and then you get on, on this next slide. Uh, you will see, oh, if there's mercury or if there's iron in it, iron are then in earth pigments, uh, it will show up. At those places, we have that. So uh, not with this one, fortunately, uh, but you will see it in a minute. And then we found out with the iron, which is there here, and then the arches, for instance, which are hardly visible actually anymore uh, on the painting itself, this is what it revealed. So from a scientific point of view, and you can think of it as, as a tool, and I think of it as a tool, but it's really very applicable. And actually, as a result, our curators would then say, but hold on, perhaps what's going on here? And not just based on this, also the feathers that you see on, on many of the hats that, that the people, uh, the militiamen uh, were wearing. Uh, the idea is about that. On the left, you can see that there is not, nothing there, whereas on the right, and then with the various different maps, you can see that there is something there. So this becomes, as a result, instrumental, and you need to do the scientific analysis in order to see how, from a humanistic point of view or art historical point of view, you can get new information. This is where the collaboration lays. This is the fundament of it. And then on an equal basis, not hierarchic in that, but really, what do you see? What, do, what would it mean? And, and then to really become interactive on that point of view, I think to finally bring that to the public through education is really very important. So when you say it's just, uh, when you think of conservation as a humanistic, or take that from the humanistic approach, I think you're cutting it short because it also really has that science component that is truly helpful for understanding it. So it's, it needs well, that. Well, and certainly in the, uh, over the years, the Kimball Conservation Department has been involved in a number of technical studies. We, we really find this work to be quite interesting. And we've really relied on the scientists who've collaborated with us. And I'd like to give a shout out to John Twilley who came today to this talk, um, who has been instrumental in a number of those studies. For example, I'm working on a Clifford Still painting at the moment where I really depend on the work of the scientists to understand what is going on. Clearly, a pigment has faded. It was John Twilley who could do the analysis and confirm exactly what the pigment was, um, lithol red. 
a very fugitive red pigment um, that was used by artists like Mark Rothko, Clifford Still. But there may be more going on instead. How much of this bloom that I see on the surface is also due possibly to fatty acid? These questions, to answer them, I really need to rely on a scientist I can trust. And so yes, I agree with, with um, Jim. It is a humanistic endeavor that we, um, conservation, but um, it's a hybrid field that relies very much on the, the input we get from scientists, as well as art historians. And I really like being in the middle of that conversation. I like being in the room with a conservator who does the hands-on work, an art historian and a scientist. And that's how, to me, you get the best result. And I think it's one of the reasons why I enjoy working in a museum so much. It fosters that kind of conversation. It supports that kind of work. I, I, I've always say to people when they come through, I think technical analysis and our work with the scientific research department, for me, and this is a personal bias, but it's, it's most exciting when it provides a window in the present to the preoccupations of the artist in the past, <laughs> that it's not um, acquiring data, for, although sometimes acquiring data for its own sake is really important. It's, it's, it's building the coral reef of knowledge, you know, I mean, those things matter. But in terms of a work of art, I mean, because I, I specialize in all master paintings, you can tell how people find it very difficult often to engage with, with, with paintings. They sometimes see a subject matter that seems entirely alien to them or totally opaque. Um, I feel as painting conservators, you know, part of what we do is about the physical meat and potatoes, but if you care about paintings, which is hopefully why you went into conservation, you have to recognize this other thing that you're trying to pre preserve in terms of relevance. The type of um, sharing of information that can maybe um, demystify or engage an interest as a beginning point, I think is great, but I think also you really hope that that leads to um, a, a meaningful relationship with works of art as works of art on their own terms. Um, you know, it, it's the poetry rather than just the vocabulary. Um, be happy to open the floor up uh, for questions. Should you have any? There's, there's one over here, Linda. Hang on for the microphone. Um, there are those outside the room listening to us. Uh, Mr. Gallagher, could you share with us uh, the authentication process you went through at the Met authenticating the portrait of Velasquez from a work of art by his studio to an authentic painting involving your forensics, art historians, and connoisseurship? Um, the, right, the portrait man that I worked on several years ago. Yeah. Um, uh, I, there was a, so material side, it ticks all the boxes of, you know, uh, type of ground at that period, um, historic pigments, paint handling. Um, so from a scientific point of view, if you want, for, for, for using a lazy word, um, but uh, there, there's no smoking gun that it is not you know, period, anything like that. Um, you then go into a, an area that is, um, as I say, subjective in that um, for myself, for people like Jonathan Brown and so on, um, well, I, actually, I think it's the minority, um, it, it's been very widely accepted, that painting now. It was borrowed by the Prado to hang by the picture that I, I personally think is a self-portrait, but the, the picture in um, the Surrender of Breda to mark as, as, a, as a sort of, um, when, when the very distinguished uh, chair of trustees stepped down, Plasto Arango, they surprised him by that picture being there. Um, and so a lot of it is, is comparing, you know, the handling, looking at the, um, things like x-radiography. I mean, I could list the I, uh, infrared, but then there is a, a sort of um, respecting people who've looked at the artist's work for most of their lives and are looking for the sort of handwriting that is beyond the materials. 
So it was a sort of um, multi-layer process of a sort of gut feeling of like, oh my God, this is really good. Um, and then wondering whether that's just a parental love that you're developing um, and you're, you know, you're blinkered or, uh, and so you bring in other people and, and then if somebody challenges that, you think, you know, the art historians in the, uh, in the institution, myself, but also more importantly, people who have given their lives over to studying the artists sort of um, weigh up those questions. Other questions? Uh, one down, right here. Thank you. Um, looking at your slides, what is going on with the uh, Nightwatch, the scanner, and what information have you gotten from that so far? Um, that's question one. Question two on this one is, um, <clears throat> did Rembrandt do the feathers on top of the helmet? Uh, how did it, dis did it disappear? And are you as a conservation person required to bring it back? And the answer is, well, you just saw the result of, <laughs> of, of indeed, what, what, is, what does it bring you? For instance, what does this uh, information bring you if you have these kind of techniques? And in this case, the macro except where we do the whole painting and then uh, what elements are in the, in, in the paint and the pigments, which pigments have been used. And we do get a lot of new information. Five uh, feathers were indeed covered by Rembrandt, first painted on and then covered by Rembrandt. Um, that also, I think, almost automatically uh, answers the question as to, no, it's not of us to do anything with that. That is his decision at the time to do that. So uh, I think that answers that question as well. I'm wondering because, as you said, only 25% of what a conservator does is hands-on active work. So do you find when you're working in public view that it somehow mediates that you sort of start acting for the public? Because so much of what you're doing just looks like you're looking at the computer, checking books, thinking. Does it affect how you behave when you're well, I, I've only done this once, which was, I say, in 2003 in Edinburgh, and it was, it, it, and, you know, it was probably in relatively early days of that as an idea, and we, were, we did have didactic information, and we uh, kept it fairly simple. It was just ropes separating me from, from them. Um, I did find, because I was doing the practical work, um, that's what I, I suppose I was meaning about mediating. If I started early morning and no one was there and then gradually people came, I was in the zone and I didn't think about it. If I started, if I had to start in the afternoon and it was a bit like showtime, people would see me starting to get on the scaffolding, it was a real effort to tune that out. And that didn't matter so much on say retouching, but I found that highly problematic if I was cleaning. And you know, I would use methods sometimes that, um, uh, you know, if you, if you clean with a tiny swab on a certain kind of picture, it, maybe it's not a good idea. Sometimes you exploit um, working with a fast evaporating solvent through a, a, um, a very, like a, a mineral spirit, and you, you work with a large swab, and then you leave it, and you might come back. Or, you know, there's different ways you get to where you need to go. That just looked very, very strange. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it when the public were there because it looked like I was late for the bus or something and I just wanted to get out of there. Um, so it, it, it was, um, you know, it, it, I, I mean, these things you've, you've addressed completely. It's a, it's a hugely more sophisticated project. I mean, I realized that um, we had frequently asked questions. We had the, all about the artists. We had what's going on here. You know, we had a, a, a little um, film without sound, but with subtitles that was updated as I was doing the different processes. But people wouldn't, would just go up to the nearest guard and say what's going on. And the guards who I hadn't taken enough time to brief would make something up. And they would say, I mean, because I, I could hear everything. They would say things like, oh, it was Lent and it got dirty. And it's like, this thing is like 20 odd foot. No, it wasn't left. Um, so I, 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 it's sort of, I was fairly evangelical. I thought this is fantastic. I can talk to people in real time. 
it, it, it's, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not on the opposing team, but it definitely, um, you know, my ardor for that sort of dropped somewhat. Or, I, or maybe I just got a better understanding of, of how complicated it is to, to get things across. But, but, but I think you're addressing exactly the point as to where you do need an educational department, and, mm -hmm. and if you don't have that, to convey the message as to what it is that you're doing. So I, I understand that that, this is really tricky. So the question is when you do it and if you're going to do it, then you have to make sure that you do this to the level that the public constantly can understand what it is that you're doing. Of course, we cannot do administrative work in front of the painting because that's also part of what the conservator is doing. So what we need is a large team of conservators, of scientists, and also to involve also our donors on that. As to Please understand, we cannot do this with our own team that we have available. Even though my department, we have in total 102 people involved in the study of, uh, of not just the night watch in all disciplines. But still, uh, you have to really, and also we have to be really careful to, to understand what is it that we're doing. Does the public indeed understand, but also does it also not just wear our staff out? Because that is also something currently we are working seven days a week, you know, that's also including machines, so perhaps that will be fine. But in the end, you know, there's a lot of people. And that, that is my final comment on that. I do think that the window that we've created as such is an exhibition of conservation where two and a half million visitors annually go and visit. So I think we as a field should use that as an opportunity and then to see where we can go from there and to open up that window on a more, let's say, uh, strengthened part that the public can make use of. Can just, I'm just curious, is it seven days a week though because you feel that you, you can't have that set up not in operation when you have a huge visitorship at the Rijksmuseum? Um, presumably there's no technical imperative to work seven days a week. You, you could, you know, not be being scanned at the weekend. I, I think it's a valid point because also the public sometimes simply wants to see the painting itself. Mm -hmm. Let it be then on a seven meter distance by a beautiful glass wall that Bill Mott in this case uh, has, has erected. Um, uh, so that, that is, I think, those are things that one should always be open for. To the, should we indeed just work five days a week and then in the weekends that everything is gone and that you can see the painting and enjoy the painting by itself? Clearly, that, that also plays a role. And, and this is where, when you start, uh, I would say, an endeavor on this, uh, in, in this part, that, that you have to take these things into consideration. And this is what we're doing as we speak. And I think one of the things that is, is raised by this question is um, uh, the person doing the work. And Robert mentioned you, know, you don't want to wear out your staff. It's a very good point. And I think projects like this tend to um, uh, take a toll that way because uh, in my estimation, a tired conservator is a dangerous conservator. Um, but I would also say that, again, in, in my experience, why um, uh, I've, uh, uh, when you are working on a painting and very, very focused on a painting, um, uh, and there are moments when the, you are utterly captivated, and those can be very, very long moments, really the last thing you need is a tap on the shoulder. Oh, uh, and if that tap on the shoulder is actually always there because you are uh, in public, uh, it's, it, it is that mediated experience and it's um, uh, the wrong kind of experience for a conservator to be having, um, uh, in my experience. Well, certainly let's do everything we can to share our knowledge, um, the process of conservation with the public. And as you've heard today, there are many ways of doing that. But also, I, th I would say a conservator's first responsibility is to the artist and to the artist intent. As you said, you, know, you don't want a tired conservator. That can be dangerous. You don't want to be distracted by the public when you're doing something as delicate and sensitive as cleaning. So we have to remember in our, in our efforts to share this really fascinating field with the public, let's not forget that we owe our allegiance first and foremost to the artist and the artist intent. And sometimes this work is better done in a calm, quiet room, in private. But then that doesn't mean it can't be shared in a multitude of ways after the fact. Any other questions from? Uh, there's one over here, Linda. 
Okay, thanks. Yeah, Peter Rulofs, uh, head of paintings and sculpture at the Rijksmuseum. I, I think what we are talking about right now is part of a broader role of museums today in society and the way we have to open up more than we've ever done before. And I think there are two main tasks here. One is we are borrowing these wonderful pieces of cultural heritage from future generations. Mm. So that's one thing, so taken care of. And the other thing is understanding. So to, let's say, enhance the narrative by digging more into, well, what this is all about. And I think by opening up and being as transparent as possible, uh, we make clear to the world what we are for as museums and that it's not, well, without a reason that we are keeping these artworks um, in these wonderful buildings and, uh, let's say, spending a lot of money as well on these collections, but it's, it's a necessity. And this is one of the main reasons, let's say, of aspects of civilization. And by working on the Night Watch in the way we're doing right now, and like Robert van Lang uh, already uh, told us, this wonderful and I believe unique collaboration between <laughs> conservators, scientists, curators, and the education department will, let's say, will really give new value and relevance to these artworks. And I think it's wonderful to see that about 300,000 children are visiting the Rijksmuseum on a yearly basis and are really involved in this project. So, and it's not only the Night Watch, but it's something that we should do on every single level, I believe, in, well, the museum professional world that we are in right now. Do you think this will, will this lead to more paintings being restored in public at the Rijksmuseum? regardless of size. No, 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 no. I, I, would, I, would, I wouldn't say the opposite. I'm, I'm, I'm a true believer that do as, as, as little as possible to the artworks. I mean, there are people that are saying, who are saying there's, there's flood, there's fire, and the hand of man who can change uh, an artwork. Bugs, too. <laughs> and bugs, too, if you know. So, so, no, it's not about that you would have to do more. It's, it's, it's what, what do you have to understand? So what Peter just said, but also what you just said, uh, we have to think of the artist and, and the artist's intent. I tend to think, no, we, have to, we are keepers for future generations. We are not here for ourselves, nor for the artist, because we don't know the artist in this case, hundreds of years ago. It's not for that purpose. It's really, I think we have to understand how, when we see a painting, for instance, right now, what was it like if you do the analysis? What, must it have looked like at the time when it was painted so that we can get a clear view from that, a better picture of that. And then we can also see that, well, then it must have looked really different from what it is now today. You know, with Van Gogh, uh, the bedroom, I think everybody knows that as to the change of color over time, how that took place. It's 100 years, 120 years. So if you realize that there is change, then you have to study that change. What are the, me the mechanistics? What is the degradation processes? How can we study them? And then ask the question, what do we have to do in order to keep this for our future generations? So our main goal is to understand, I think, how something was projected at the time, and then what the idea, in this case, the artist's intent must have been, then looking at the degradation, and then asking the questions, how old will the night watch become? Of course, hundreds of years, but, it, with the high-resolution photography that we're doing right now, and then I'm talking about that you can go a thousandth of a millimeter, five thousandths of a millimeter, and get an accurate picture, actually, of what the status of that is. Well, in 10 years from now, if you would measure the same thing with a, another digital camera and look at it, and then did that crack actually continue, yes or no? What did happen with the Nightwatch? And I think what we need to do is, is make use from all these different aspects and, and including also all departments, it's not just the four departments that I, that I mentioned, also communication, also publicity, but also security, that you, that you stand there as an entity and that you say, look, this is what we are looking at. This is what we're going to focus on. And also to draw that baseline to understand the zero measurement of that art is changing, even though 
very gradually and very slowly, but it is changing. And we do have to study that. And if you think the value that we all put there in our lives as to how important we think that our cultural heritage is, I think we should simply, you, we need more money in order to study what is going on. Because in some cases, we simply don't know, and we want to know. No, Michael, come no, on. No, I, 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 agree, I agree. I think, I agree with 99% of what you say. I think the one thing which is not, uh, this is not a challenge to what you're doing at the Rikes oh. Museum with the, with, with the Night Watch. As we all sit here, we're all deteriorating um, very, very slowly. <laughs> and we're very glad that people are devoting a lot of energy in understanding how we're deteriorating and how we might be able to slow that up. Um, and and that, I'm not being facetious, that's, that's very true. Um, at the same time, we each have something beyond that. And um, I just wouldn't ever want to see conservation. I mean, I'm always conscious, I mean, I'm, I've got to give a talk next week on a painting I just finished conserving, which is the Titian's Pietro Aretino from the Frick. And I'm doing something for Save Venice. Um, and the, we've, we've found a lot of very interesting things of the development of soaps and so on. I don't want that picture to sound like a graveyard. It is actually a miracle that it's still on its feet, really, when you actually look at what has happened to it. So I feel like part of my job when I talk is to, on the one side, say, this has changed, this is very abraded, this is a really tough lining, this, um, it, it had a very dark edge, which seems to have been an accelerated development of, of lead soaps that has, has, has caused a darkening on the edge, which was compensated for in retouching once that deterioration was understood. But I also want to celebrate the picture. And I think that is, um, what we walk this, this tightrope of, um, of, of, of sharing uh, knowledge and analysis and at the same time um, championing poetry. I think that's... No, no, yeah, I, yeah. I fully, I couldn't agree more clearly because it's the artworks why people are coming to the museum to enjoy that. But 15 years ago... We need to ago, wrap up because I think that we are... Losing our Facebook time. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll we wouldn't want that. Sure. Yeah. 15 years ago, it was Patria Noble, was it 15 years ago or 18 years ago, who first found out about the metal yes, soaps, yep. that, that they are actually there. And, and nobody knew that. Nobody realized that. And now that has become mm -hmm. almost a field of study uh, yeah. by itself. And righteously so. And that's my yeah. point. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So if All right. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get the thank you in here. Yeah. I just want to... It's very important for a piece of housekeeping that I bring your attention to the fact that the Association of Professional Art Advisors was the group that initiated the idea for this panel and that has evolved into this you know, terrific conversation you've heard today. Jim, I, did, I'm, I cut you off. Were you going to say something more? Uh, no, I was just going to try to summarize. But Please. You, um, uh, OK, uh, um, very, very briefly, I was on a panel once um, uh, with a number of artists, um, uh, one of whom was Robert Ryman. And he received a, a question from uh, the audience uh, about his paintings. And I think the question was about how does he um, uh, know that a painting is done? Um, and this gets a little bit to the question of change, because it's always changing on the artist's easel. Uh, and he started, and he paused. He started, and he paused. And then he just said, every painting is a little miracle. And you know, I, I think that um, uh, every painting remains a little miracle before and after it come, goes through the conservation studio. And that's very much uh, the, the retention of uh, the miraculous is very much what we're um, uh, talking about here today. So thank you all very much. All right, that's a great note to end on. And it's a good note to, to think about while we know that we're in the process of degrading as we stand here. So I, um, I, I, I hope you enjoy this terrific conversation. Please come back for more. And uh, thanks one more time to this fabulous um, and wonderful and terrific and stimulating, exciting conversation with these panelists. Thank you. Thank you.